79 was the year when things began to get really serious. But certainly Dateland really was the one, the defining moment. First public shot in the cocaine wars. The shootout occurred at about 2.30 this afternoon when two or more Latin males entered the Crown Liquor Store here on the west end of the Dadeland Mall. They were followed by two or three other Latin males, and then the shooting began. I mean, we knew exactly the minute we heard that. Another Colombian drug-related machine gun. Right now, two people are dead, and there are others injured. Inside the liquor store, one Colombian national and another non-Cuban Latin suspected of drug trafficking lay face up in a pool of blood. But I went racing down there, and I said, I'm from the Miami Herald, you know, what happened here? And uh, the cops were just shocked and scant. I have never seen in my life uh, uh, an extensive amount of, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, how would you put it? Well, July 1979, I had been in homicide about two years, but this was just... Uh, beyond the scope of anything but anybody could have imagined it that, up until that day. Well, there was this glass, there was debris all over the place. There were bullet casings uh, on the wall, uh, on the floor, on the shelf. It just looked like a uh, old western shootout. The assailants sprayed gunfire all around the parking lot. Did you see what happened to him when the shooting was over? They ran. They I, uh, I don't know. I was running. Innocent bystanders dove for cover. Cars were riddled with machine gun fire, gas tanks spilling out. Actually, there were two scenes. There were the primary scene where the two dead bodies were inside Crown Liquors. But the secondary scene, which is where I was assigned to, was what has become known as the war wagon. A delivery van was found abandoned in the north side of the mall with the door open and the motor running. It was a 1979 brand new Ford Econoline van converted into an armed personnel carrier. It was just a death machine. It had reinforced steel welded to the sides. Windows could be popped out, used as gun ports. You know, it said happy time party supply on the side. Inside, we found 14 different weapons. These killers were like the Dixie Cup generation, the throwaway generation. They would shoot a gun until it was empty throw it down and pick up another one. And you name it, shotguns, carbines, a MAC-10, an Uzi, assorted handguns, ammunition for all of them. The war wagon was really, I think, the big turning point where the police realized what they were up against and how outgunned they were. What would the amount of weaponry in that van indicate to you? Well, they were well armed, we can say that, and they, they came uh, prepared to to do battle. Bullets were flying everywhere. The final tally were that 86 rounds had been fired by all the weapons. God knows, I don't know how many how many times these people were shot. There's just so many bullet wounds uh, over these victims that uh, it just made it uh, impossible for me to determine the exact number of uh, shots. You did the standard follow-up leads. The truck had been falsely registered. The firearms had been bought under false names. You went to the addresses, and the ones that were good, the people had fled. So it was your typical Columbia case. You know, went nowhere fast. Officers searched the surrounding neighborhood for more than an hour, but turned up no suspects. They said another open pending. Open pending means an unsolved case because we had had no success whatsoever to date closing a Columbia murder. We had a brand new phenomenon here. The level of violence was unprecedented. The sophistication was unprecedented. I think this was the first case where we had actually a machine gunning in a public place, middle of daylight, shoppers and passers-by around. Of course, after that, that happened frequently. It was the beginning of a war, the cocaine wars down here. Local homicide detectives say Miami's in the middle of a narcotics war between Colombian and Cuban drug dealers. Miami was changing. The Colombians were pushing the Cubans out. There was a mad scramble for market share. And one of the reasons for the violence was because of the competing factions. And the violence is what turned Miami into the cocaine cowboys. As they call them, the cocaine cowboys. They call them the cocaine cowboys. This cocaine cowboy thing, it was sold people from Medellin. Estimates are that as many as 100,000 illegal Colombian aliens are living and working the drug trade in South Florida. They would go after their target. They'd kill the wife. They'd kill the maid. If there's a dog, they'd all kill the dog. If there's a bird, they'd all kill the bird. If there's a goldfish, they'd all kill the goldfish. If a Girl Scout rang the bell to sell cookies, they'd kill the Girl Scout, too. Poor people that were standing there and kids, anybody would just get chopped up. They just would kill everybody in sight. Jesus Hernandez. A submachine barrage tore him apart in his car on a busy southwest street at noon. Numerous machine gunnings. And then I heard the ba-boom, ba-boom. Pop, 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 
pop, pop. And the apartment was sprayed by machine gun fire, a trademark, according to police, of the cocaine cowboys. On the highways, the turnpike, US-1, in some cases, residential streets. The red Mustang was heading north on Southwest 107th Avenue. The green sedan pulled alongside the driver, opening fire. The tools of death, automatic weapons, and shotguns. So that's the kind of stuff you see on television. You don't see it in real life. Witnesses describe the scene as a war zone, Miami Vice without the cameras. But this was real life, and it was really going on. You have five people killed here, you have three people killed here. A quiet residential area in Kendall tonight became the scene of a grisly mass murder. Six bodies were found in a posh townhouse. Miami police say this is the worst multiple homicide in the city's history. Police believe the massacre was drug-related. We're talking about mass murders that in this day and age would get breaking news coverage from all the cable TV stations. We had that level of violence happening daily, and the local media, because of us just being saturated by it, saying, oh, it's just a double homicide, oh, it's just a triple homicide. It just became commonplace that we were going to be jumping from crime scene to crime scene. We have to have more than four or five people dead to make a big deal out of it. I mean, I can recall getting five murders in one night. There have been eight murders in Dade in just the past 48 hours. You never knew when you were going to stumble over another body. Miami kind of resembled the St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago in the 20s. Gangsters driving through the streets, standing on their floorboards with their Thompson 45 machine guns, having gunfights in Chicago in the 30s. What I see going on here would make Chicago in the days of Prohibition look like a Baptist Sunday school picnic. And one of the cops then even said, like, Dodge City. And it was like the wild, wild west back in there. But of course he was wrong, because Dodge City was never as violent as Miami was then. Miami, in the early 80s, was considered the most dangerous place on Earth.